How y'all doing? Y'all got me worried here. Y'all know y'all rebels, right? You know. I love it. I love it. Well, this is a real, a real honor for me uh, to be a part of this, uh, this conversation, but more importantly, uh, this movement uh, towards preserving, protecting, and defending democracy. Uh, towards lifting up the values of America and the principles that we live by. And you, all of you, are on the front line of that. And so the honor for me is to be here with you and to thank you up front, not at the end, but at the beginning of what I have to say, for what you are doing, what you are bravely enduring, and what you're about to do because that's what I want to talk to you about. And I want to lay down for you uh, some tracks so that we understand and get our heads around the moment we're in. Because we can't deal with stupid, <laughs> right? We can't deal with ignorance and not understanding what this moment represents. So thank you for allowing me to share some thoughts on that. And thank you, Heath, and the entire Principal First uh, team for bringing us together this way because it's because it's important and I see my buddy Mr. Raffensperger in the house so I know I'm good right <laughs> I'm safe so so I want to start with the 1970s the 1970s America was changing the idealism of the 1960s were being tested by the trials of Watergate in Vietnam, from the full-throated expression of conservatism by Ronald Reagan, I recall as a young man that this time was different. I recall what seems so strange to some people today, that a 17-year-old black kid growing up here in the inner city of Washington, D.C., could find himself, his values, his priorities, his beliefs, reflected in what he heard from a Republican Party and its leader, whose experiences and backgrounds were so very different from his own. In a life spent advancing Republican principles since then, I've had the privilege to do so when it wasn't particularly easy. In fact, in many instances, it was unwelcomed. And yet, with all my Republican bona fides, like many of you in this room and outside this room, in today's Republican Party, it's not enough. It's not enough. Over time, we would watch Republicans lose their voice on things that mattered as they bent the arc of the party towards the baser motives of one man who was neither a Republican nor a conservative. More and more of the men and women who once stood on the front lines of moving the party into the future were forced to retreat from that future and watch this once honorable political movement rooted in principle and core philosophies spiral into a cult of personality. So I'd like to begin this conversation with a defense of the things, and a particular thing, that our mamas told us as young kids that we didn't have too much of, common sense. <laughs> what our parents knew is common sense is the unsung hero of our decision making. The silent guy that often go goes unnoticed but remains an essential element of our daily lives. It's the pragmatic, intuitive wisdom that helps us navigate the intricacies of existence, offering practical solutions to complex problems. In a world where we're bombarded with information and conflicting opinions, common sense stands as a beacon of clarity, guiding us through the noise and the chaos. So what the hell happened? How did we lose our common sense? Common sense is supposed to be an equalizer. 
It levels the playing field where the wisdom of a sage aligns with the insights of a child. But when it comes to our politics today, it appears the children have gagged and bound the sages. In the complex landscape of contemporary politics, the application of common sense is often overshadowed by partisan agendas, polarized ideologies, and sensationalism. However, harnessing the power of common sense in any political movement and its decision making is not just beneficial, it's imperative. It's imperative for the well being of our societies. At its core, common sense in politics involves approaching issues with practicality, rationality, and a focus on the common good rather than the personal or partisan gain. It requires a shift from divisive rhetoric and entrenched positions towards solutions that actually benefit the broader population. Which brings me to our two political parties. Political parties, as many in this room have come to learn, are at times a bit like a rash. <laughs> Unsightly, irritating, and lacking any intellectual or ideological coherence. However, also like a rash, political parties can be a problem. They cannot be safely ignored because a rash may prove inconsequential. A rash can heal itself. But in the case of our current political climate, it may be a symptom of a malady that's much more serious with consequences that could leave a permanent scar or worse. You see, since our founding, the story of America largely has been about what we aspire to be. No doubt our recent presidential and midterm elections have tested that proposition as our elections have become more and more about what pisses us off, what makes us mad. Historian Alexis de Tocqueville once noted, quote, there's nothing more dangerous than unmet expectations. And it has been the unmet expectations of countless Americans fueled by the lazy and oftentimes incompetent behavior of elected officials, compounded by the zero-sum engagement of both political parties that have defined the current political landscape. We've allowed our anger and frustrations to be exploited to the point that we no longer recognize the face of America, or that it doesn't have to be the great America because America is blessed. Folks, we've lost sight of our blessings. We are blessed by the fruits of this land. We are blessed by the spacious skies and amber waves of grain. We are blessed by the exceptional nature of the people who call themselves Americans. And at the heart of all of that is the faith, is the faith that we place in freedom. This was important to our founders, so much so that they enshrined this ideal in these words, quote, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Damn. They wrote those words when a lot of people in this room weren't included in them. But we are now. And that is the blessing of America. 
But while the idealism of our founding would be transformational, transformational, so too were concerns about its lasting resilience. Ben Franklin noted upon the signing of the Constitution, quote, our new Constitution is now established. Everything seems to promise it will be durable. But in, the, in this world, nothing is certain except death and taxes. <laughs> Indeed, Franklin would go on to say, quote, the people must take part in and support the government in order for it to be successful. Let me repeat that. The people must take part in and support the government in order for it to be successful. During his 1776 farewell address, President George Washington warned, quote, however factions, political parties, may now and then answer popular ends, they are likely in the course of time and things to become potent en engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power of the people and to usurp for themselves the reins of government destroying afterwards the very engines which have lifted them to unjust dominion. Washington and Franklin knew what the hell they were talking about. They saw us coming. And now we bear witness today to Washington's warning. As for example, the Republican Party has become infected by such cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men who have done their very best to subvert the power of the people. We've watched senators and House members walk away from re-election because of this infection. Representative Liz Cheney lost her Republican House Conference chairmanship and ultimately her seat in Congress because of this infection. Our fellow Americans stormed the halls of the United States Capitol because of this infection. But once seized by infection, we must want to get better, to be better, to do better. How else do we go on to form that more perfect union? Liz Cheney was direct and to the, to the point about this, quote, we cannot embrace both the big lie and embrace the Constitution or even democracy itself. Because defending the indefensible time and time and time and time and time and time and time again has left a stain. It has left a stain on this country and it has left a stain on us. So while former President Trump has spent considerable time successfully reshaping as much of the Republican Party into his image and failing that, setting the rest of it on fire. The fracture within the Republican Party is not the biggest issue in American politics today. And we lose sight of that. In fact, this fracture was long in the making before there was even a President Trump. Now this fracture is significant in highlighting the ongoing battle to preserve, protect, and defend American democracy. From voting rights, the Constitution, and the rule of law, to the once lauded choice of principle over partisanship, character over corruption, and country over party, we have witnessed the systematic deconstruction of the legitimacy of our republic, ultimately to the point that one of our two major political parties declares that the events that occurred on January 6th were legitimate political discourse. How messed up do we have to be to get to that point? Americans are exhausted, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. But the question I have for all of you in this room and those of you who are hearing these words is simply this. Are we so exhausted that we can't begin to address our wounds? That we can't begin to unify behind our shared beliefs? That we can't again look at each other and say, let's do this together. To truly unify, we must first be honest about what our nation is going through 
And more important, give a damn about it. And I presume that's why you're here. Because you give a damn about your country. You give a damn about your neighbor. You give a damn about your friends. Hell, you give a damn about people you don't even know because they step foot on this soil and want to be a part of this great experiment. Because they want to find their little piece of the American dream as many of the families and individuals in this room have and outside this room have. That's been our story. That's been our blessing that we've shared with the world. And you give a damn enough about it to want to protect it. Our republic ultimately has reached the point that our minds are fogged over by the magnitude of post-COVID life and current global events, the distractions of politics, but we've always found a way to lift each other up as we lift the nation to do better and to be better. As Mr. de Tocqueville noted, quote, the greatness of America lies not in being more enlightened than any other nation, but rather in her ability to repair her faults. Remember, as I said, <laughs> remember, as I said, it's not about America's greatness, but rather about how blessed we are and that uh, we have the ability to face adversity and the difficulties that we encounter, to repair our faults, and to move our country forward. And now the hard part. This is where your leadership comes in. This is why each one of you are here to help us heal, help us repair, and help us reconnect with our fellow Americans, and to help each other understand why this wacky, crazy experiment still matters in the 21st century. You listen today and you will tomorrow to people laying out practical solutions, and they are important, and they are real, and they're doable. And we digest and we go through and we kind of work out some of the angst and the pain and the frustrations we have with all of it. But it's time, folks, to get busy. It's time to get serious. It's time to stop making excuses. And it's time for each one of us to stand up as part of we the people, the legacy that's been handed to each one of us to help strengthen this country and to move it forward. You just can't sit on your ass and think someone else is going to do it because they're not. You have to lead now. You have to be the leader now. Because our country has witnessed difficult times. It's witnessed an appalling injustice and at times falling far short of the ideals posited at its founding. We have learned that, notwithstanding our ideals and the heroism and sacrifice of prior generations, we still remain vulnerable to the appeals of baser elements of our nature. How much do we really, truly appreciate the dangers of unmet expectations? Are you even concerned that at this hour, our nation is moving further away from its ideals and hopeful optimism? Are you just rationalizing all of what's happening because of the tribe you belong to? Which do you value more, the price of gas or the price of freedom? Which concerns you more, the increase in the rate of inflation or the rate at which state legislatures are decreasing access to the ballot box and fundamental rights? The problems we face are real. And voters, particularly those maligned as deplorables or as clinging to God and guns and religion, or coming from shithole countries, or from cities no human being would live in, those people, our fellow Americans, are right to feel marginalized and ignored. 
Many of our communities, particularly those far from Washington, New York, and Silicon Valley, are afflicted by growing despair. In turn, that despair breeds pathologies that further afflict our neighbors and even our families to where basic truths and facts are no longer believed. And one individual can come in and reshape the land in his image. Through the choices we have made in scores of national and local elections, we've abolished slavery, expanded suffrage, welcomed the immigrant, provided the conditions that have fo that fostered a standard of living unmet anywhere else on the planet. More important, the men and women we choose to lead during these times understood that despite all else, our American purpose remained to work toward achieving the ideals written on parchment 248 years ago. More than most, President Abraham Lincoln understood that those ideals, if they were implemented, would be transformational. A nation conceived in liberty could, and it did, empower us, each one of us, we the people, in this moment, to help our country, to stand with our neighbor, and to defend against illiberal, ugly behavior. This is our time. The question is, do you still believe in America? And it's on us to understand and answer exactly what that question is asking. Finally, Addressing a, a reunion of Civil War soldiers in 1875, President Ulysses S. Grant predicted the dividing line in the nation's great, next great conflict, quote, will not be Masons or Dixons, but between patriotism and intelligence on one side and superstition, ambition, and ignorance on the other. 1875, y'all. He just called us out. He just called us out. The narcissism and self-indulgent grifting in Washington and state capitals across the nation not only impedes the formulation of sound public policy, but it has corroded our politics, bastardized our patriotism, turned facts into lies and lies into truths, and made our personal relationships one to the other nothing short of nightmarish tribal entanglements. Everything's a fight. We have become like our, our public officials, either too afraid to speak truth or apoplectic about banal and absurd nonsense. We lose our mind over dumb stuff. An electoral or governing coalition that coalesces around a personality or the latest rantings of unserious people rather than addressing the nation's needs is not just unsustainable, it's dangerous and debilitating. It is not leadership. And that is what you're required to bring in this moment, each one of you, leadership, that's focused and driven by principle, that people see themselves reflected in, their pains, their aspirations, their desires, elevating up for them their freedoms and helping them understand why we're all connected. So I have no ending here. That's why you're here. Because the ending is left up to each one of you in this room when you walk out that door. You're writing it. You're going to live it, you're going to share it, and you're going to make it possible for someone else. And it will either be a good ending or it won't. Dr. King knew that his dream, that movement towards civil rights and human dignity, would not be realized on that National Mall in August of 1963. It would not be realized in his lifetime but rather would in fact rest in the dreams and ambitions of future generations of Americans as they faced, like his generation, 
efforts to use the Constitution and our civil rights against us. He understood that was the essence of the dream, that we would rise up in that fight as we witness our leaders today using our rights and the Constitution against each one of us. His faith in us led him to believe that we could nonetheless write this new chapter. Write this new chapter on behalf of liberty. Write this new chapter on behalf of freedom. Write it on behalf of opportunity. Write it on behalf of the American dream. But the question is, are we willing to do so? Are we willing to pay the price to do so? So defeating ambition and ignorance with patriotism and intelligence begins with applying a little common sense. As we do so, we must not only embrace but proudly extol our core democratic principles like pluralism and civic responsibility, the rule of law and constitutional order. This is how we defeat the tyranny of Donald Trump. This is how we defeat the tyranny of the illiberal, destructive behavior that undermines the very value of the proposition that all of us are free. Last point, we have work to do. Otherwise, this does not end well for any of us in this room or outside, this wall, or outside these walls. So don't screw it up. 